Muy buenos días. Good morning and welcome to everybody here. We are starting a little bit late, and we have here six extraordinary personalities with us, and we only have now 35 minutes left. So there are not only many complexities in the world, but these add <laughs> to the complexities that exist. But nevertheless, we're going to reach the goals that we have uh, established for this session in a very complex world that is uh, marked by many conflicts because there are uh, global and regional uh, complexities. Well, nevertheless, Latin America is still very dynamic and the landscape is very diverse. Latin America is still exploring different visions and policies to um, overcome different um, issues and create good conditions for a good social and environmental development. In a global context, the region is also a source of opportunities and has solutions for the development and to overcome all the challenges that we have globally. With our panelists here, we will explore some of the priorities in our region the uh, emerging challenges and how we're going to assure uh, that our region can benefit effectively uh, from this potential. We're going to start with you, Mr. President. Thank you very much for being here today with us. Uh, we are really uh, grateful. Let's see how the situation is evolving in Colombia and which are the two or three priorities that you would like to highlight here for your country in 2024. Well, the priorities are focused on solving the problems that are the most complex and deep ones. And in the case of Colombia, they have to do with two main topics, peace, how to eliminate the causes and the factors that cause violence and inequalities. And these two are linked. Social inequalities, well, Colombia is the, th the second or the third most unequal country in the world. Latin America in general is the most unequal country in the world, uh, region in the world, and this uh, inequality is equals violence, violence that has changed along the history, along the decades. How to solve this? Well, this cannot be done just this year. It's a very long process. It's a very complex one. But we would like this year to put the country on the right way of pacification and equality that are not reversible. But so peace has a counterpart, and violence and social inequality have a, a dark side. The, uh, another uh, aspect, which is the uh, territorial uh, inequality. It, Colombia is a re, uh, country that is really fragmented, regions that are very diverse, and part of these uh, regions are excluded, uh, have been excluded for centuries, and this is the um, legacy of slavery. It's a way of production that uh, persisted till the 19th century in Colombia and Latin America. So if I take the violence and I add it to the territorial uh, inequality, I have another couple of terms which are uh, related because violence has to do with uh, illegal economy illegal economy, illicit economy in excluded territories. So uh, territorial uh, inequality is linked to violence or to the possibility of peace. The illegal economy is the product, among others, of an anti-drug economy, uh, an anti-drug policy at a global level that has failed completely. And this has 
taken Latin America to a crisis in the coherence of the society and democracies. A million people have died due to a wrong policy against drugs. So if I want peace, I have to overcome uh, territorial inequality. And this carries me to transform illegal economies into legal economies in the region. I know I don't have enough time, but this transformation is for me the key this year, because for two centuries it hasn't been possible to transform the uh, excluded Colombian territory to uh, prosperity. And I, will, I would like to end with this. The um, Pacific coast in Colombia, there is, at that region, the free slaves, the slaves that got freedom by themselves, mainly black ones, they arrived there. And it's the only region in the Pacific which is really poor, extremely poor, because since we have the legacy of slavery there, the uh, white elites of the government who are focused on Bogota never cared about that region. And now it's the most important cocaine producing region in the world, cocaine which is consumed by the rest of the world, and it's the poorest region in Colombia. So there we have the challenge of transforming the region. If China and Japan on the other side, where there is no uh, mountain separating them, or, or California or Alaska decided to help, to really help, we could put this region in the Pacific from poverty to prosperity, just crossing the sea. And we would have a possibility, or the possibility to overcome violence. Thank you very much, President. Peru is uh, presiding uh, APEC this year, and this will be a good opportunity to um, rebalance the uh, relationships between the uh, Pacific, uh, the Asia Pacific region and Latin America. President, you are coming from Guatemala now, and international support given by, well, the president and other uh, people that were there was really decisive to uh, assure this democratic transition in Guatemala. What is the importance of international support to uh, guarantee more institutionality and to consolidate these uh, democratic processes in our region? Well, the history in Guatemala and contemporary reality is very similar to Colombia's due to social inequalities, the racial fragmentation in the society, racism, uh, levels of violence that have been achieved because there was a, a long uh, revolutionary uh, strive. There was a peace process. The process was not respected in Colombia by the state because mm, some prosecutors decided to destroy the basis of popular um, elections because the state was fragmented. We tried to... Uh, there is a criminality in the government in power the uh, criminal organizations have seized political power and part of the society and the state does not want that. They want to deepen democracy. So for all these reasons, the electoral uh, uh, triumph of uh, uh, the uh, president. For instance, a uh, uh, minister of defense cannot go to Guatemala because he will be put in prison because Dr. Velasquez uh, guided a special investigation against corruption in Guatemala. So all these regions uh, make our two countries very much alike. So the defense of democracy in Guatemala is also the defense of democracy in Colombia and in Latin America. So we need to uh, uh, work together. It was a very critical moment. I was about to not be able to come here. But up to now, things have gone well. Guatemala, as Colombia, 
needs. First of all, people that are active, that defend democracy, because if not, we're lost. And then we always need, we also need solidarity from the world with projects of democratization, like in Guatemala or in Colombia or in Latin America in general. Of course, President. And this takes me to another question that I'm going to ask to the President of the uh, Supreme Tribunal of Brazil, Mr. Barroso. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. And I would like to ask you, Latin America, the institutionality, and the rule of law are still part of the uh, great challenges in our region, as President Petra has just said. And the uh, uh, judicial judiciary uh, is a very important branch, which are the um, institutional difficulties that we are living in our re region. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I was about to uh, uh, speak in English. I had prepared myself to speak in English, uh, but uh, I'd rather speak in Spanish. <laughs> The truth is that Latin America has a colonial heritage and a past of slavery and a past of inadequate territorial occupation which has led which has left a legacy of poverty and inequality. So some factors, chronic factors, which all have, have always made institutionality difficult in Latin America are poverty. Almost 30% of the Latin American population lives below the poverty line, extreme inequality, the past and the present to some extent of a private appropriation of public space by extractivistic elites, and sometimes that leads into corruption. We have a chronic educational problem. Latin America has not invested enough in education, especially in basic education, and I think that this is what has left us lagging behind in history. There is low economic growth, which makes it difficult for a health generation and distribution because of injustice internationally to some extent, but also because of several uh, domestic circumstances. And it has become more severe with the problem of public security and violence. And I think that we have to include this concern into the agenda, including in the progressive agenda. Progressive thinking has always neglected public security to some extent, uh, attributing it only to poverty of and inequality. That's a fact, but poor people also know, uh, need rather public security, not to remain just on negative aspects. I think that the Latin American continent today provides major potentials for the world, and I would like not to dwell only on negative comments. I think that Latin America can and should take up the leading role of a global environmental position because we have biodiversity, we have the largest amount of drinking water around the world. We have Amazon, which is the greatest uh, store, uh, uh, storage place uh, for carbon in terms of global war warming. We have peaceful living together of countries with well uh, established frontiers, except for a fright or another. In spite of all institutional problems, democracy has remained in most countries. The large countries like Brazil, Mexico, Colombia, Argentina, Chile have managed to preserve their democratic institutionality in spite of several difficulties. We have no re relevant religious conflicts, and we are a multicultural, multi racial um, society with all of the prospects that offers to the world. So without neglecting chronic problems that afflict us, that have to be resolved, I think that Latin America provides major potentials to the world that can be well tapped into if we find the right pathways. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. You have talked about insecurity. I would also like to acknowledge 
I would like to acknowledge the uh, participation of Mrs. Sommerfeld, who is representing her, her minister, which, uh, who cannot uh, be here. So what is the situation in your country, and what would you like to commend here in this international arena? Thank you very much for the invitation. And on behalf of President Novoa, he's sending you uh, his uh, great um, warm uh, greetings. He cannot be here, but he's sent part of his cabinet uh, to represent him here. We're all women here. It's the first cabinet with gender parity. So there we see the differences of our president. What I'm listening to here, what I'm hearing here is no different to what is being lived today in Ecuador. But I would like to uh, talk here about the uh, perspective under which Ecuador is uh, living today. The reality is that only seven uh, of 10 Ecuadorians uh, have a job. The president say that 250,000 uh, young students uh, come from college each year and don't have a job. They don't have uh, activities. They don't have work. They, uh, we, they don't have a job. They don't have work. We have lots of problems with immigration. Mm, over uh, 500,000 uh, Venezuelan citizens are in Ecuador. We are a transit country, and we also have lots of immigrants or, or mm, Ecuadorian immigrants uh, to the um, uh, that go outside the country so we they're, they're n we don't have we don't give them opportunities job opportunities but there is also a lot of uh, insecurity so in this uh, landscape all the vulnerable communities have to uh, work have to do something, have to uh, act. And if they don't have a job and they cannot study, so what do they do? They start committing crimes. And this has weakened the country because uh, criminality has increased enormously uh, in institutions, public or private uh, institutions in Ecuador. And this has weakened, uh, terribly weakened, all the institutions that deal with uh, security and with the uh, judicial system. And all this have taken the country to a point where criminals are in power. It's uh, organized criminality. It's organized crime. And these organized crime uh, groups, which are violent, they threaten uh, citizens and many uh, shops have had to close. In 2022, 4,000 uh, businesses have had to close, and partly because of the market, partly because of high costs and, uh, and high uh, financing costs, but partly because we had the so-called vaccines. Vaccines, that means that each shop that was polluted with this organized crime had to pay to keep open. Because if not, either they killed them or they destroyed the shops. So these small shops, these micro-businesses, or small businesses couldn't keep on working because they couldn't pay for these vaccines. And this was institutionalized, so they had to close. And if we think that the first job generator is the, our SMEs and micro-businesses, well, if we have if we destroy the productive basis of a country, what can we expect from a country, from uh, the economy and from the society of our country? Every day, uh, more and more people start uh, uh, or, or part of organized crime. In December, and this is to conclude the idea I was expressing, it does ju just accept, affect uh, companies, but the civil society uh, and, 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 uh, and the community, because if uh, people go out on the street, they're not sure if something is going to happen to them and if they will be robbed. And uh, the country ended up paralyzed due to 
to fear and lack of opportunities. So we were really down. And in December, the justice system together with the, the government, together with the prosecution office, um, uh, moved 900 uh, uh, officials to pursue uh, um, corrupted uh, elected uh, people and uh, this uh, changed a lot of things and uh, President Novoa uh, issued a decree in January, beginning of January that said that Ecuador was uh, in a real uh, state of shock and by January a second decree was issued where that states that thanks to the actions taken the first day, uh, because there were even channel uh, uh, television channels that were attacked by criminal uh, bands, criminal gangs, there was a second decree was issued and uh, declared things and called things with their name. There's an armed a non-international conflict. We have identified 22 terrorist groups within Ecuador. How can we help? Uh, how is Ecuador, what solution it does Ecuador seek? Yes, that's what I wanted to explain. Once uh, all this happens, we gave power to the armed forces to help bringing order internally, and this hadn't happened until now in Ecuador with uh, the police. But 95% of the population uh, is in favor of the president's decision. So the, the citizenship was oppressed by criminal uh, organized crime. And the population supports the government and the armed forces and the police so that they carry out their job in an opportune and efficient way. But the most beautiful thing we saw is that as we started calling things by their names and calling these people terrorists, Ecuador launched, uh, called for help. The whole international community responded, and that's what I want to say. These are, of course, problems in a small country like Ecuador, but um, it is not the responsibility is not just for Ecuador. This organized crime uh, it feeds from no, um, drug traffic and illegal mining. And this is a problem that affects many of our countries and both these industries, because they are industries, feed organized, international organized crime. We're a transit country for drug. We're not, uh, we don't produce or consume drugs in a, uh, uh, but this is not a, a, a a product, product, a producer country uh, of drug, but uh, we got the support of every country, uh, and this is uh, something I would like to point out. Yes, uh, Minister Barroso and the President Petro uh, uh, talked about the root cause of the problem and the uh, international support to look for a solution. Vice President, this is your fourth year that you are uh, working with uh, your president, Viñareda, and what are the uh, lessons you could share with us about your country, about what you succeeded that could uh, be uh, useful for the rest of Latin American countries. Uh, yes, thank you, Marisol, for your invitation and gr warm greetings to my uh, panelist uh, colleagues on behalf of the uh, president uh, and on my own behalf. Uh, we're convinced that the learned lessons in uh, government management uh, are revolve around a strategic vision, as we did in the Republican, uh, Dominican Republic, we recovered the economy and we guaranteed a better and, and a greater social investment since 2020. And we saw that it was key, as uh, President William, William Inabel, uh, 
uh, help all of these sectors of society work on um, uh, improving. And we worked with the academia, with the state, but we gave a lot of relevance, support, and support to the private sector without forgetting the civil society. This was uh, greatly important for us to face pandemic. Uh, we vaccinated the whole Dominican population. And with this, we succeeded to preserve lives. We are 10.7 million inhabitants. And if, as President Binaber said, one casualty is too much, we had 4,500 people who died, unfortunately, due to COVID. So at the same time of this uh, vaccination, we worked to, uh, with the President Abinader, uh, let me work on pandemic. And in the meantime, he reactivated the economy. We didn't close tourism. We didn't lock tourism. And this one was the best decision, because today we may uh, uh, be proud of a collaboration model uh, and a partnership between state, uh, private, and public uh, uh, initiatives. And last year, we broke the record of 10 million visitors in the uh, Dominican Republic. And this is a lesson we learned from ourselves, but also from all our brother countries that surround us. We need to guarantee the institutionalization of our country, and we need to reinforce democracy. And nothing is magic. The only magic is to keep on working from government in a transparent way to uh, deal with corruption, because uh, fortunately, societies cannot accept corruption anymore, because corruption means a bad uh, standard of living for the inhabitants of our countries. So as uh, President Abinader did, we fought corruption, we fought money laundry, and, uh, we, and we went to war against uh, drug traffic as well. And all this, we translated it into a series of specific actions and public uh, policies that improved the quality of life for all uh, Dominicans. And we reinforced institu institutions, and we kept working on influ influencing uh, uh, transparent and just policies, promoting uh, companies and uh, entrepreneurship, especially uh, female entrepreneurship, youth entrepreneurship, and training is essential. We need to uh, uh, help uh, in, in, in progress and innovation. Yes, uh, we're talking. We need, uh, of course, a technological transition, and that's and uh, yes, because of time, you we will be able to come back with a question so that you can tell us about the importance of innovation. I would also like to give the floor to the uh, to the chair of the Inter-American Development Bank. What could we do to avoid a new lost decade, as many believe? Here, we all uh, want to prevent this from happening. What can we do, President? Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity. It's a pleasure to be here. I think we're on the, uh, to the contrary. We're uh, facing a unique opportunity. I think Latin America has a potential to be at a real uh, turning point, because for the first time, I think we have a symmetrical relationship with the world. Uh, Latin America and the Caribbean was always kind of a side of the world but, and, and needed the world. But I think now the world needs um, uh, Latin America and the Caribbean uh, region, because they are part of our uh, revolution. Uh, I'm going to give you examples, the cr clean energy and we you know very well. Uh, food production for the world, the Amazon and biomasses, or a sponge like uh, Pet President Petro says, these are world solutions. How can we make sure that 
we take up this opportunity along. And I think that we need to be able to absorb influx and uh, we need stability to uh, uh, take advantage of this opportunity. And institutional relationships are quite relevant, as uh, President Barroso said. And as many of you said, the security is quite relevant because physical insecurity is uh, prevailing and uh, we need to stop that. And uh, also, we've had good growth periods from 2023 to 2013, but this does not uh, reflect in a productivity here. We need to improve education and uh, skills, and uh, once we have stability, we need to generate productivity and innovation. Thank you, President. One very short question, integration in a region, in Latin America and the Caribbean region. In your opinion, what are the areas that have potential so that we can uh, go forward in an effective and practical integration? This is where we seek, the, where we seek consensus. Uh, the, uh, uh, IDB uh, works where it sees that there are opportunities. I'll give you two examples. Amazon Forever. This is a program we're carrying out, and President Petro is here, other countries, Ecuador too. We've had, we saw a political will, and I think we have a unique opportunity of several uh, players to play together. And I I think that this uh, is quite positive. Then other, another example, in Mercosur, they are uh, discussing physical and digital integration. The route that comes from Brazil, Guyana, and the Oceania, the, uh, so the IDB is working and is going to invest $10 million to work on this. So I think that there's a moment where we can work on regional integration and the global uh, context is quite polarized, uh, fragmented, and this leads us to, forces us to integrate more and more. Thank you for such a hopeful uh, regional vision. Uh, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Marco Bulgheroni about the role of the private sector because it was already mentioned as a productivity and employment facilitator. In your opinion, what is the role of private sector and what is the sector of greater potential from your perspective, please? Thank you, Marisol. Yes, traditionally, the role of the private sector is linked to investment and employment uh, uh, development, uh, employment offer, but as uh, President, uh, the, pr Vice President Peña said, and, and as president of the IDB, Ilan said, uh, we need to invest. And we've seen examples uh, where the private sector through uh, playing played a role of uh, change uh, player in Latin America. And I'll give you two examples, the uh, food uh, sector. The food sector uh, doesn't usually uh, offer much employment or uses much technology. <clears throat> and uh, it uh, presents uh, low innovations. But in the last decades, we've seen a revolution, uh, and uh, this sector has started uh, using new technologies. And uh, nowadays, the food producer has work has uh, totally changed. Uh, direct sowing in Brazil and Argentina has helped, and also the improvements of seeds uh, has uh, uh, 
brought more productive hectares, which means more uh, grain and therefore more uh, food security for the world and also uh, a better management of the earth, of the, of the, of the land. And um, we also see innovation uh, around the food uh, companies. Uh, nowadays, a food producer has a processor, is guided by GPS and uses digital technology. And he monitors the hectares that he's sowing and uh, cultivating with uh, satellite images. Second uh, sector where the private sector has been a change agent, but I think we need to continue to do it in the future. It is my sector, oil and gas. There's a great transformation that expects us, which is the energetic transformation. We need to be players of this energetic uh, tra transition. We from Pan American are um, committed to it. We don't know which technology will help us to solve uh, climate change, but we know that we need to produce as a sector, as an industry, we need to produce more energy for million consumers in order to support the uh, growth of economies, but this needs to be an energy of lower emissions. It needs to, we need to help decarbonize uh, the uh, energy used by our economies. We're doing it in the Americas, and uh, this is a way to be uh, players and not victims of this process. And we're investing in renewable energies, in bio uh, fuel, in lithium as well. And we see that throughout time, more and more companies are uh, entering this process. Therefore, I'm convinced that private sector has a relevant role. Without an industry, it will be harder to do. And we have to self-impose uh, to be leaders on this sector, in this sector. And I'd like to say that it is not just the private sector. We need a partnership with the public sector and, of course, with the financial uh, bodies that need to finance these projects more and more. So I will ask you for more money. In, uh, thank you very much. And uh, there's time for one closing remark, President Petro. As you all know, the central topic of our meeting in the, uh, economic, uh, in the World Economic Forum is uh, uh, rebuilding trust. Uh, how in a diverse and pluralized uh, uh, backdrop with uh, uh, players with different visions in our region, President, how can we reach consensus and uh, progress towards more cooperation and a better uh, uh, integration? Well, there's always two ways, that, which is to increase uh, division, fragmentation in America, generally speaking, and I'm not just speaking about the uh, ch chimney in the north the, with the CO2, but uh, the, the forest in the south. So there's two ways to take. Uh, and with either we continue this paradox and we separate again more uh, north, uh, which pollutes more and more with uh, greater, s greater levels of social destruction, and the south, which uh, keeps its potential without developing it. And victim of violence, which is due to uh, criminal uh, uh, organizations uh, together with uh, uh, politics. So there's another way, which is the pact, the meeting up, uh, looking for common objectives. And this way, together with a chimney, is a sponge, and it eliminates the chimney. 
uh, for the future of the planet. But we need to plan this option, and it, this means to reach agreement to delocalize the, the American production towards Latin America. It means thinking of a common agreement as the president of the Inter-American Development Bank. It mean, it requires an integration in Latin America, but it requires also an American integration and in the European style and looking at Europe around a, a project. And what Europe did on carbon emissions, we need to do it with clean uh, energy. Uh, yes, we will do it, uh, Mr. President. So we uh, take uh, this message uh, on a concern uh, regarding public uh, security and uh, that we need to solve in Latin America and also the relevance to uh, finding consensus for a better integration and innovation and technology because I think that Latin America needs to push this. We can't be left behind. So thank you for such extraordinary responsibility personalities who are, have such a great responsibility to fulfill the Latin American dream. Thank you very much.